then hear um, the appellant's information and then listen to any public comment. Uh, I then, uh, at the end of this, make a recommendation to the director. The decision whether to uh, remove trees, keep trees, add fines, do whatever is that of the director. So I try and get the, give the director as much information and uh, as possible. But at the end of the day, it's up to the director to decide whether uh, my recommendations are accepted or rejected. So, um, and, and then from the director's office, uh, the appellants and anyone interested in uh, the findings uh, will be notified. So if any of you want to put your email addresses or any contact information into the chat room, uh, the director's office will then have that information and can provide that to you. So there'll be no decisions issued today. Decisions will come at, at a later date. Um, I, I want to thank everyone for their patience, both for me and, and, and I will ask that uh, you be patient as, as we work through these Zoom things. It's not um, always the easiest things to do, but we want to give everyone a chance. So uh, I will find an opportunity for some reason. I miss someone. Please don't hesitate to reach out and, and let me know because the goal is to make sure that everyone has an opportunity uh, to be heard. So with that, um, the way the hearings will go is we'll call the hearing. Uh, the department will, will speak first. We'll then ask the appellant to speak. If, the, if there's any follow-up, uh, we'll have that opportunity. And then we'll ask the public to speak. Uh, I ask that you, know, you be respectful of one another. We all have different opinions and that's all fine. And uh, that anything be directed to me and not necessarily to any of the speakers so that um, uh, the questions, issues, comments should be directed to me. So with that, um, we'll, we'll stop uh, as far as my introduction goes. Um, are we going to take things out of order? Is that the, Ms. Nauberry, is that the, the way we're going to go? Is Hastings last, you said? That's, that's last, number seven. Okay, so we'll go right down the order. So we're going to start with item number two, order number 203-786. It's 65 Ocean Avenue. And the hearing is to consider the removal of 12 street trees and two significant trees with replacement of eight trees at 65 Ocean Avenue. Staff approved removals and the public protested. Department? You're muted. Sorry, I'm muted. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen. OK. So just for the record, if everyone could uh, state their name, who they represent, and spell it so we get the spelling correct, that would be great. Um, okay, so my name is Susan Nauberry. Um, I'll be representing the Bureau of Urban Forestry tonight. And just for our attendance record, um, I'm just going to keep emphasizing that um, please email urbanforestry at sfdpw.org um, and you'll be added to the contact list to receive resulting decisions. If you previously submitted a protest, we already have your information, um, but if you want to receive information on the other cases, uh, please email us. So our first case is order number 203786 to consider removal of 12 street trees and two significant trees with replacement of eight street trees at 65 Ocean and staff approved the removals and the public has protested uh, this item was continued from last month um, because of the difference of labeling between street and significant trees. Uh, we have since straightened out that labeling. Um, it is eight street trees and two significant, uh, sorry, 12 street trees and two significant trees. Um, so these are the trees on Ocean Avenue. Um, there, are, there are eight street trees on Ocean Avenue. There are seven Metro Sideros Excelsa, which are New Zealand Christmas trees and one Ginkgo in the middle. Um, you can see they're behind the fence line, but they actually sit right on the property line. So they straddle the property line. Um, they are not at the curb, which makes it a little confusing, uh, but our measurements and our Arbor Pro census has determined that these trees are actually street trees, not significant trees. 
And so this is just a closer view of the trees that were farther on the right um, by the bus zone. Um, it's trees five through nine on their plan, although we order the trees um, ordering from with the flow of traffic. Um, and you can't see on the far right, but um, that there's a street tree tucked in there behind um, one of the other trees. And that one's a street tree. And then there's a tree behind it and that's a significant tree. And I personally measured all of these trees myself. Um, so I know that these are street and significant trees. And uh, you can see that they both have very poor structure. They've been topped in the past. Um, this building, not by the owners of this building, this is a, an older property. Um, and there's a, the second significant tree, a uh, Pitosporum. Um, it also has poor structure. It's a little bit dark in there, but there's a little bit of decay from past topping cuts. Um, the other thing is that these uh, trees are all kind of raised above grade a little bit um, because they're planted in property by the previous property owner. Uh, so this is tree two um, and it's, or it's our tree two, but it's their tree. Um, it's a little bit, it's reversed, so it's tree eight for them. Um, and you can see that it has very poor structure. Um, it's probably, it was probably topped right at that point when it was first planted or uh, very early on. And it has very uh, deeply included bark and the limbs are crossing. Um, this tree, you know, if let to grow any larger, probably have some major limb failures. Um, and you can see in this photo that the trees are above grade, above sidewalk grade. And so um, this is the next tree, but it's just emphasizing that many of the trees have been uh, topped in the past and have very poor structure. And when you have a tree this size, it's very difficult to correct the structure. Um, the larger cuts you make, the more chance you have of, of introducing a decay pathogen. Um, and this is uh, the ginkgo in the middle. It also has very poor structure. It's very small. Um, and essentially because all the replacements are 36 inch box trees, this would be an in-kind replacement. Uh, this is tree six. Um, it's actually in fairly good condition, has good structure. Um, but again, because these trees are all sitting right on the property line, any excavation work occurring right up to the property line would essentially destabilize all of these trees. Um, so it's pretty difficult to build the building as planned and designed without entering into the critical root zone of every single one of these trees that are basically sitting right on the property line. And this tree is just some, it's tree seven, the multi-stem tree. Um, and it has multiple codominant stems at a lower point in the main union there. And it absolutely looks like it has some stumps spreading there probably for some past damage. And uh, trees on Alamany frontage, there's a trident maple. They're not climate appropriate. You can see this picture is taken in August. It has a lot of dieback. Um, they do not like California weather, do not like this climate. Um, they require a lot of water. Uh, they require summer rains and cold winters. Um, and we don't really have that in San Francisco. Um, so this tree more or less has stagnated in growth. Um, it hasn't grown very much. Its structure is also not very great. And when I say structure is poor, I mean that you kind of want a tree that has a main union um, and the limbs that are growing laterally should not be the same size. Those are called codominant stems. And tree two on Alamany, uh, we planted these trees two years ago. Um, it is a major challenge for us to water trees right now. And um, because this project is planting 36 inch box trees, uh, the trees would essentially be replaced in kind also, um, but then would alleviate the city from watering uh, these trees. Um, this one in particular looks a little wind burned. Um, it's missing some of its lower canopy. Um, it probably was vandalized at some point. And then the third tree, same situation. It does have predominant stems. Um, it would require a lot of structural work. 
to fix this uh, tree to make it have good structure for the long term. Um, and also it's only two years old as well. So it would essentially be replacing kind as a 36 inch box tree. A uh, tree four is missing, it likely died of planting shock. Um, because of the economic climate post pandemic, our landscaping funds have been essentially decimated. So replanting the trees has been very difficult. Um, so this basin is empty um, and it will no longer be empty once this project plants these trees. And uh, tree five, um, same situation. Uh, this one has a little bit less vigorous growth than the other two. Um, so it will be re replaced in kind with the 36 inch box as well. And unfortunately I do have like an update for this project. Um, first this, so basically what I looked at is in order to retain all of these trees, the building would have to be set back at least 70 feet to make room for construction. Um, it's really hard to build right up against trees. We see this a lot in other counties where um, they retain very large trees, but years later they die of construction impacts. And by then it's too hard to go after the buildings for replacement trees because they've been sold and changed hands. Um, so oftentimes removing the tree before construction begins and getting um, the promised number of replacements and aloof fees uh, may work a little bit better than allowing construction to occur within the footprint of the critical root zone. Um, and it, we are aware that these are established trees, but in this case, it doesn't seem like construction would be feasible, um, especially not without shrinking the building footprint. And um, as stated by the applicant, um, and they state that keeping the existing trees will result in a major reduction of square footage. Um, they have a home density bonus, um, which effectively requires uh, further residential units to be built. Um, so they'll have significant losses in that case if they shrink the building. And a lot of these um, decisions, the building design are made at the planning level. So the Bureau of Forestry's job is to assess the trees, see what the construction impacts would be. Could the trees survive these impacts? Um, the Bureau of Urban Forestry has not as much decision-making when it comes to redesign of the building. Um, these plans are set in place years in advance before the Bureau of Urban Forestry uh, does a review. And so I advise anyone who wants to take part in these uh, decisions to go to the Planning Commission's website. Um, they have a website and they have commission meetings that the public can join. Um, but the building designs are often just set in place. And so our job is to assess if our trees can survive uh, these construction impacts um, as best we can and to mitigate replacements. And so this building has 440 feet of frontage. Um, and so that requires 22 trees, which means they can only actually plant eight trees. And so we want to be as upfront about this as possible. Um, because it's better to be upfront about the fact that there will be a loss of trees now rather than later on when the construction gets going. Um, but they will be planting 36 inch box trees that will be maintained by this building and watered and they'll be paying 14 in lieu fees. Um, in addition, the construction code doesn't take into account the loss of the two significant trees. So the building understand, the project owner understands that they'll be paying uh, two additional in lieu fees. Um, so they'll actually be paying 16 in lieu fees and planting eight trees. Unfortunately, I have an update for you. Um, so the GC for the project notified Buff that two trees were removed prior to project issuance. Um, and we'll let them speak on how that occurred. Um, but we did issue the fine for Ginkgo and we appraised the value of both trees um, but the ginkgo appraised for less than the in fee, and our code requires that we um, pick the one that's higher. So we appraised the ginkgo and the reason we were able to appraise the value is because um, essentially there's going to be a net loss of trees on the site. So we we're able to appraise the value um, if the tree were replaceable or we don't, we can't really appraise the value. Um, so the Metro Sideros, the tree on the right actually appraised for 7,300. And that total is $9,493 and that has already been paid. So we consider the matter of the fine um, complete 
here. Um, and tree protection has since been installed. I visited the site myself. So that's the ginkgo that I showed you previously that was illegally removed. And the tree that was illegally removed there. And I just wanted to point out that that tree on the right, um, it measured beyond the significant zone. So it was not a street or a significant tree. Um, but this is just a view from the inside to show which trees are removed. Um, and this is the plan just to show which trees actually I measured personally and compared to the plans and there. So the trees in the circle are not protected, although they, they are shown on the plans, they are not street or significant trees. Um, and then the two trees with the X's have already been removed. Um, so we just want to be as transparent about that as possible. And um, I, I looked at the site and I don't think that the removal of these trees accelerates the building construction because the demolition of the building is actually towards the, the bottom of those plans the, away from the trees. Um, so unfortunately it was an error, um, but we did issue the fine and the fine has been paid. And so to be consistent with how we handle similar cases, the Bureau of Urban Forestry approved the removal of um, 12 street trees and two significant trees. Okay, does that conclude your presentation? That concludes the presentation for 65 okay. action. Just a, a couple of questions before we move to the appellant and then we'll let the public speak, including the applicant. Um, on the tree where you had the access for the removal, you, you said there was two trees that have been removed, but there's actually three trees with X's. Correct. The tree with the X is not protected. Okay. It's not a street or significant tree. And I measured these myself before I even posted the trees for removal. Okay, so that's, um, that's, not, that's not one that's... Yes, so that is not one that is of concern to us, even though the, there's an X there. Gotcha. This is drawing is provided by the... Um, applicant. Correct. And then the second question I had is, is uh, the code requires 22 trees. We're replacing it with eight. And, and is that because of the construction would not allow the replacement of all 22 or, or, or the planting of 22? Correct. So um, if you look at this planting plan here, um, there is a bus zone on ocean. Correct. And we can't have trees in bus zones and it's only okay. a 10 foot sidewalk. So the only situation where we could have trees and bus zones is if it's a 15 foot sidewalk. Okay. And um, they also have multiple vaults going in, which are required. Um, and again, the vault placements also decided at the planning commission. And okay. so they're loading up all the replacements on Alamany, which I vetted the placement and they are properly placed and spaced. Um, and Alamany does have like the most traffic um, it's a louder street. So at the very least, adding the replacements on Alamany will mitigate that. Okay. All right. So, so in other words, they're replacing as many trees as, as they can, which is what, what we're, is what the department suggested. Correct. So they're they're required to maximize the tree planting. And and they've done they've done that with this plant. Okay. They've and done it. Have... Correct. Sorry. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, uh, it, it, would the appellant like to speak? So whoever the appellant is, if the appellant would like to speak, and then we'll let uh, the, the, the project sponsor speak. I'm looking on the... Does the appellant want to raise your hand? Yeah, I'm looking on the... And I don't see anyone raising their hand. I don't either. If you're dialing in, we don't have any dial-ins, but if you're dialing in, you can hit star six from your phone. The appellant... Okay, so what we'll do then, we'll, so, so uh, appellant, we're not gonna forget you, but we'll move on to the project sponsor and let the project sponsor speak, and then we'll give the appellant another opportunity. So is a project sponsor- uh, John Kelvin uh, is here, has, has his hand raised. Uh, John, go ahead and unmute your phone. <clears throat> can you guys hear me? Yes. Sure can. Great. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Nawberry, for your presentation. Uh, good evening, John Kevlin here, J-O-H-N-K-E-V as in Victor, L-I-N, with Ruben, Junison Rose, on behalf of the project sponsor, Presidio Bay Ventures. 
Uh, the proposed tree removal at 65 Ocean Ave is necessary in order to construct the approved home SF project at the site. Uh, the project is a 55 foot tall building with 193 units. 25% of those are affordable uh, and a 6,000 square foot uh, affordable childcare use. Uh, an appeal of the project was denied at the Board of Appeals in January, 2020. And this is the first home SF project in the city, uh, which provides a density bonus in exchange for greater affordable housing than is otherwise, re otherwise required by state law. Now the project is being built to the lot line on all three frontages, and so therefore requires the removal of uh, the 14 significant and street trees along its ocean and Alamany frontages. Uh, and as Ms. Nabari said, um, uh, staff has reviewed and approved the removal of all these trees after um, some significant analysis. Uh, the project will replace the 14 removed trees with eight new street trees consistent with the Better Streets Plan. Uh, there are a number of, uh, uh, getting to the last question, there are a number of conflicts uh, in the street along Ocean and Cayuga, uh, the bus stop, there's a number of utility vaults, and there's also the project garage entrance. Uh, such that the project is unable to provide the trees every 20 feet along those frontages. Um, on the Alamany frontage, the project will replace four, uh, four or poor, uh, sorry, fair or poor trees uh, with six new trees, and they will have expanded 48-inch tree wells. Um, and then in lieu fees will be paid for the 16 trees that cannot be replaced. It's a total of $35,000 to be used elsewhere in the city to improve the tree canopy. Uh, and as Ms. Nabury mentioned, uh, unfortunately, the GC was doing staging at the site a couple weeks back. Um, they were not aware of this pending action and they did remove two of the trees. Uh, it was not authorized by the project sponsor. Uh, we notified Ms. Nabury as, as, as soon as we found out about this and uh, are paying the increased uh, uh, fine or fee uh, as a result. Uh, so th that much more to go towards uh, the improvement of the tree canopy elsewhere in the city. Uh, so in closing, the removal of all 14 protected trees are necessary for the construction of this important city project will be replaced with the maximum number of street trees, uh, all of which are consistent with city tree guidelines and will result in significant additional city funds for the improvement of tree canopy offsite. Uh, and thank you. And we're here, uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, if you have any questions. Very good. Lisa, thank you very much for your presentation. Is there anyone else from the project that's going to speak, sir? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, very good. All right, so uh, department spoken, project sponsor spoken. Uh, would uh, the appellant like to speak? Uh, we'll look to see if there's any raised hands or if any member of the public would like to speak, uh, we'll see if there's any raised hands. It looks like we have Lance. Lance, go ahead. Uh, Lance. We have, have somebody. I think we have to unmute him somehow. Yeah. No. He. Uh, we. Uh, he just needs to unmute. If not, we can go. Hey Lance. guys, it's, it's it's John Kevlin again. I just got a request to unmute, so uh, uh, this is not for me. Okay. okay. Very good. So okay. We'll Thanks, can you hear Lance. me now? This yeah. is Lit Lance. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. So just to repeat, uh, I I wasn't the appellant on this this particular project. I did point out to. Carla Short, that the um, the application and the um, checklist that were submitted by the applicant uh, did didn't jive with the uh, with the rest of the project with, with the project permit, and that was corrected. Thank you. Um, I'm also just you know th there's one thing that, that happens with these particular projects. This is just a comment. It's not an objection or anything, but um, apparently this has gone through planning years ago or quite a while ago. It's been approved and uh, the trees need to be removed to do the project. And I, I guess I'm, I'm sort of curious about Bureau of Urban Forestry's role in this. They come in and they say, well, we got to take all these trees out. And then they go through the trees and say, well, this, this tree is not in good shape and this one's going to fall over tomorrow and yada da. If you're going to take the trees out for the project, why do you have to go through the condition of each tree? I mean, if, suppose a tree was in great condition, would you keep it? So I, I just sort of find it a little bit disingenuous to have trees you know, downgraded on the fly here uh, when, when they're gonna come down anyway. So um, that's my, and that, actually, I'd just like to make one more comment to Buff, if I could. There are three other projects on the agenda 
that do not have applications filed. And uh, I wonder if they could just make a, a note to always put the, app, the uh, permit number in the uh, listing, the online listing that we have to look at. Okay, thank you, that's, that's it. Very good, thank you, sir. I appreciate your comments. Uh, Mr. Clip, I believe uh, you have your hand up. You've been unmuted. Or Yeah, can you hear me? Sure can, sir, go ahead. Thanks. Um, okay, Susan, I wanna thank you for that very thorough presentation. Um, regarding the, um, the fine here, I noticed that you know one of the things that Susan mentioned that I'm I know several of us out here are already aware of are the the financial crisis which has already led to a near complete reduction of tree planting budget while we're simultaneously fighting climate change and a pandemic that's forced a lot of us to look to our street trees for access to nature while we're stuck at home. So I guess considering all of this, I I'm not sure why the department hasn't gone a little more aggressively after available re remedies especially when you consider that this particular applicant was well aware that they did not have a permit for this work since this was continued from the last hearing. Relatively speaking, the penalty is a pittance compared to the value of the project writ large. And this kind of uh, penalty just rewards bad behavior. Whether it was intended or not, it was work done without a permit. And that's not something that generally other departments in the city of San Francisco take very lightly or just let folks off with a slap on the wrist. And so for instance, I would, I would ask the department to go back and consider all of, the, all of the penalties that are available under section 811 of article 16, um, and specifically fines that are available for work that is done without a permit. And then regarding the comment of, of the Bureau's role in the various stages of development and primarily the last stage of development where it some basically, you know, there isn't much point to trying to, I guess, as Lance said, look at the, the status of the trees if we all know they're, they're coming out because of planning. This is something that the public has been raising up for, for years in, in these forums, in front of this, this department, these departmental hearings, in front of the Board of Appeals. This is something that um, I think the city is very aware of. And, uh, but for all of us coming to these hearings, maybe nothing would be done about this or even known about this at all. So I would just like to note that the department is really very well aware of this massive shortcoming. And I would encourage the department to take some steps to fix this itself, whether that is the superintendent, whether that is the director of the department talking to, to the director of planning, but the members of the public are the only ones on these calls that are not paid to be here. And we're continually having to spend what few hours we may have in the day or the time I could be spending with my wife right now, uh, you know, to tell the city how to do a better job by our environment and by our people and by our ecology when the city already knows what it has to do. So I, I will continue to raise these things up, but I would really ask that the city do as much work as we are all out here doing for free to make these changes. Thanks. Very good, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm looking to see if there's anyone else with a hand raised that wishes to speak on this item. I'll give it another moment. Have a we did have a raised hand, but they lowered it. So I think we're good to go to the next uh, next item. Right, I did see that raised hand briefly. Okay, very good. So um, with that, if there's nothing else, uh, uh, Ms. Newberry, do you, would you like to, uh, anything else or we're, we're good? Hearing nothing else, I assume we're good. On mute. Okay. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll sorry about that. Oh, that's all right. No problem. <laughs> we can move on. All right. Sounds good. Uh, with that, we'll move on to item number three on the agenda. It's order number 203 787 3400 Laguna Street to consider the removal of one significant tree on private property with replacement at 3400 Laguna Street. Staff approved the removal of the public and removal and the public has protested. Department, please. Um, so this is a Brazilian pepper and um, our inspector actually made a little video and she wanted to speak on the matter herself, but she's on military leave so she couldn't uh, or she's currently in active duty. Um, so she made this little video herself. So um, hopefully you guys can hear and see it. The Bureau of Urban Forestry approved the removal of one significant tree on the property of 3400 Laguna. 
A significant tree is a tree on private property within 10 feet of the public right-of-way that meets one of three size criteria, a 12-inch diameter trunk, a 15-foot canopy spread, or 20 feet in height. This tree is located approximately 7 feet from the 15-foot right-of-way. The tree is a Brazilian pepper tree and in this setting provides shade and ornamental value. Unfortunately, the tree had a failure at the main scaffolding limbs. One quarter to one third of the tree canopy failed in August. As a result, the tree is unbalanced and susceptible to future failures. A hazard tree is a tree with structural defects, likely to cause failure of all or part of the tree, which could then strike a target. A target can be a vehicle, building, or place where people gather. The tree was topped in the years past and as a result has poor branch structure. Urban forestry approved this tree for removal because pruning cannot mitigate the poor structure. The canopy is unbalanced and susceptible to future failures, especially as the branches have some poor attachments from previous topping cuts, and these branches are newly exposed. The property owner should be granted a removal permit to replace the tree. Okay. So hopefully you all heard that. Um, so I'm just gonna go back and in case anybody for some reason couldn't hear that. Um, so the tree basically had this major failure where um, there's decay at these unions and um, essentially it has exposed these upper limbs, these remaining limbs to failure. Um, you can see that they have very little interior canopy. Um, so you can't prune or reduce to um, reduce the end weight because there's nothing to prune back to. Uh, that would essentially be considered topping and there wouldn't be any canopy left in there. Um, and then the tree would also have to tap into its reserves to produce sprouts, uh, which ultimately shortens the life of the tree and it would um, leave it more susceptible to decay. And it has obviously been topped before, which is why it has this structure. And then it was then limbed up um, through the years, various arboricultural practices have been have been done uh, by various property owners, and essentially this tree cannot be saved by pruning. Um, but there is ample room to replant the tree. Um, it's in the backyard setback, and there you can see the the wound and decay that Sarah had uh, put in there. The inspector, Sarah had put a photo in there in the previous video, um, but you can see it in here in the photo. And they also have plenty of room for replacement. Uh, the replacement will be placed in the significant zone, so it will become another significant tree. Um, they will be required to plant a tree that can become a significant tree, which is 15 feet in height, 12 inches in diameter, and it will be within 10 feet of the public right of way. Okay, so those conditions, as far as the size and placement of the tree, are part of the part of the permit agreement? Yes, so it must reach 20 feet in height. Yes, yeah, so basically if they remove a significant tree, they have to replace a tree that will become a significant tree um, unless there's no room for replacement. In this case, there's ample room for replacement and the property owner understands this, uh, will replace a tree and yeah, it will become 20 feet in height, 12 inches in diameter or 15 feet in canopy spread. Okay, all right, very good. Thank you very much. Um, is the appellant uh, present or would, would the appellant like to speak? So if you are, please raise your hand. I'm All right, looking. Uh, uh, Lance, but before Lance, can we, is the appellant present? Do we know? I don't know who the appellant is. One, I, I only see one hand raised. I'll go ahead and let uh, Lance go ahead. Okay, go ahead, uh, sir, Mr. Carnes. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Can, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, and once again, I just want to point out that on the listing, the Bureau of Urban Forestry has an online list of trees that are up for uh, removal. Um, this one has, it says that the owner applied for a permit, but there's no application in the online permit file. So. Um, 
we have no idea what the conditions are on this. I, I would like Bureau of Forestry maybe make a checklist when they list things online. If it says the owner probably applied for a permit, please list the permit number. Thank you. Um, also, um, I looked at, there, there's a photograph that, that um, Ms. Nybury showed a little earlier that showed about half the tree falling into the property side of the, look, a whole bunch of branches, there you go. Um, and uh, I guess those were removed. Um, I saw this tree on, on, in, in the photographs and I actually lived pretty nearby. So I walked by one day and looked at it. It's not that big of a tree. It's, a, <laughs> it's probably only like 15 feet high or something. So um, and, in its current condition, after these branches were removed, it looks like it's pretty stable. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not an arborist, but you know, I, I wouldn't remove that tree if I were the owner. I'd, I'd uh, maintain it and, and let it be. Um, and they also mentioned that the tree had been topped, which I presume is an illegal or a, a non-recommended practice in, in arbor, arboriculture, as they call it. Um, and I wonder if there are any fines that have been uh, levied for this. And also it seems perhaps the tree was not maintained um, in, in for many years, it wasn't pruned properly or um, maintained properly. So are, are there any penalties for this that, that Buff can, can apply to the owner, even though it's their tree, um, we're now responsible for, um, you know, getting it either removed or, or you know, fixed up. Um, so if you could comment on uh, penalties for, for improper care like topping or lack of pruning. Thank you. Ms. Knobber, uh, do you want to respond to that? Two, two quick questions. Sure. So we don't know when the tree was topped. We just know that there's evidence of topping based on the structure and the decay. And um, I can't say whether or not that was put, that happened before or after the significant tree ordinance was put in place. Um, we also don't know if this current owner topped the tree. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to know when the tree was topped, um, but there have also been a lot of changes in the way municipalities have managed trees. Um, and the topping is definitely frowned upon, but more recently people didn't understand that you don't do interior crown cleaning. Um, people think that it, that helped air go through the tree, which is 100% um, a myth. You don't want an interior crown clean. Um, you basically want to remove interior canopy when it, you want to correct structure. But uh, basically, we don't know when this tree was topped. Um, and we don't know whether or not it was before or after this we have a tree ordinance. So I don't think we assess any penalties for this. And we probably won't assess penalties retroactively. OK, very good. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Clip, I think you're next up with your hand up. Uh, yep. Go ahead, sir. Um, yeah, just a, a point of order since it's a public record and our words kind of matter. I think we refer to someone as the appellant only if the decision by the Bureau was against the applicant. Um, otherwise, it's just the applicant. Um, <clears throat> I also want to uh, compliment Sarah Stacy on that video. I think she's set the bar pretty high for Chris Buck's next presentation. Um, I can't comment on what the tree looks like in real life, but because I haven't gone by or looked at it. But what I would say is um, regarding replacement, I know that um, Susan mentioned it would be a significant tree. I was wondering if there would also be any consideration for um, maximum environmental benefits. So say for instance, a native species um, that would be, you know, this is one of the things that a lot of, you know, we've got a whole, um, biodiversity and native species group of folks in the city that are constantly pushing for the planting of native trees. And in terms of the department's perspective on that, it usually takes a really big sidewalk and tree basin to support that. So I'm wondering if that is something that they would be able to push for in this instance, um, since it does have the space and um, the headroom uh, for something like that. Thanks. Ms. Dalbear, do you want to respond to the replacement question? Oh, we can certainly advocate for a large stature tree. It's, it's a little more difficult when it's in private property. Um, our code definitely gives us leeway to do that. 
in the sidewalk uh, for street trees, but it's a lot more difficult to um, regulate that requirement on private property unless it's a construction related, which in this case it's not. Okay. But we will certainly advocate for a larger stature or more environmentally beneficial tree um, that this owner would also be comfortable with um, in terms of helping them choose the species and helping them figure out which species is most suitable for their uh, property. In, in this case, there is a lot of space. So we'll, we'll advocate for uh, environmentally beneficial tree. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Clip, if, if, I, if I don't mind, just so I'm, I'm correct in the future, I guess the reason I'm using the term uh, appellant is because it says the public protested. And so uh, they were, my, my thought was they were appealing the staff recommendation. So if that's, if my use of that term is incorrect, uh, please let me know. Because I, yeah. I, I want to. Yeah, I no, be... appellant is usually the, uh, refers to the applicant whose application has been denied. Um, members of the public who protest are just members of the public who protest. We don't have an official, a really official name for ourselves unless we actually appeal the outcome of this hearing. Okay. All right. Well, very good. Well, then, then I'll, I'll call them pro. Okay. Well, I'll just call them public. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate the correction. Of course. No problem. So, uh, Mr. Mahler, Eric Mahler, I see your hand up. Would you like to uh, speak? Hi. Thank you. Uh, we were the applicant on this project. Okay. Um, as Joshua said, Sarah did a great job outlining all of the all of the details. The only things I'd like to add are this was actually the second instance of significant limb failure on the same tree. Um, the photo that you see right now uh, on your screen is actually the first time that it failed and then approximately 20% more of the canopy failed uh, two months later. Um, that's, that's really the only thing I'd like to add. Great, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate your, your time and, and um, adding that information. Okay, is there anyone else that would like to speak? Let me look through the, uh, the list, see if there's any hands raised. I don't see any, but you wanna make sure. Okay, so I see none, uh, hearing none, I'm gonna close this item. All right, so uh, we'll close that item, move on to item number four. It's order number 203-788-1122 Broderick Street to consider a removal of one street tree with replacement at 1122 Broderick Street. Staff approved the removal and the public has protested. Uh, Ms. Lottery? Mm, so we have... Um... A eucalyptus sideroxon, a red iron bark, and it is a street tree. Um, it is very large, very mature, very established. And if this tree had um, better structure, we would certainly not be pursuing the removal of this tree. Um, the Bureau of Urban Forestry is taking on this removal. There's no application associated with it. And the reason is because the structure is so poor, the limbs are so weakly attached that it has been having very frequent limb failures and it has been requiring very frequent pruning and cleanup. Um, with all these return visits and the amount of maintenance required, um, the tree is essentially has like very little canopy remaining on the interior. Um, so you can see like all the canopies at the top, there's very little interior canopy. Um, which trees grow with photosynthesis, leaves help put on, uh, help absorb carbon. Um, carbon sequestration helps put on mass and with a reduced canopy in a tree this size, um, the vigor is going to be greatly reduced. So it's not actually going to put on mass that quickly. Um, and essentially, there we go. This species also has a tendency to drop limbs and it takes a lot of maintenance to, to do this sort of work. And, and if you actually look at how well this tree is growing and how much canopy it has versus how, much, uh, how many return visits and the amount of risk it poses, uh, we basically decided that this tree has uh, outlived its essentially its benefits to the public right of way 
And I know it has absorbed a lot of carbon. It has a lot of carbon in that wood, but it, what it is doing is not putting on that much growth because it has very low vigor. And then it's requiring a lot of resources to go and maintain that tree. So this is where in urban forestry, the tree is basically hit the, the axis of the cost benefit analysis. And um, because the, this tree also has a public, sa it's a public safety issue um, with like the limb failures, um, we also can't undermine the public's trust in us to maintain the urban forest. Um, the tree is replaceable. It, if approved, it would be removed, but it probably wouldn't be extremely quickly um, because it's not, it's going to be done by the city, um, but it would be done to prevent these limb failures um, in the future uh, when we're at least close to that area to do maintenance. Um, we want to see this tree approved before um, a very rainy winter um, where more limb failures could occur. Um, to be consistent with how we handle all these similar cases and the, the fact that the tree has very weakly attached branches, low vigor and low canopy, um, the Bureau of Forestry approves the tree for removal uh, with replacement. Okay, so for the replacement, uh, can you speak to the replacement? Uh, we have not, we have not gone that far into it, but it, we have not gone down that road uh, very far, but it will be a large stature tree because it has, there's no overhead lines. This tree has to be replaced by the Bureau of Urban Forestry. Um, but again, I cannot promise on that timeline. Um, however, it's a large basin and we know that the Friends of the Urban Forest has grants with CAL FIRE. If they plant large basins, um, CAL FIRE will essentially fund that and we can water it um, even though our watering is very, very tight. Uh, but when we consider the replacement tree, it will be a large stature tree. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so Renee, and, uh, Renee had her hand up, John, and I'll go ahead and if you can go ahead, Renee. Thank okay. you very, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. We yes. Can. We can. Wonderful. Uh, I am the co-owner of 1120-1122 Broderick Street, and with the aid of my neighbor, Merle Easton, who lives at 1130, we have been agitating to have this uh, removed. Let me give you, as quickly as I can, the history of the tree. Redevelopment planted eucalyptus down both sides of the two to four block uh, of Broderick Street back in around 1974 or 75. Along came a fantastic wind, which knocked out and caused the removal of all the other trees except our tree, which was protected by our building. And Remedios Munar, who is my co-owner, did not wish to have this removed. All the history of this tree has had this unusual bark situation in it. And about two years ago, uh, a neighbor wanted uh, a visual uh, access to the East Bay and chopped down uh, the tree and an arborist said, you've ruined the tree. Well, that was back I'd say at least 10 years ago. Uh, the last two or three years, the uh, tree has shown uh, this, this tremendous difficulty. And two years ago, when we had our strong, strong rain, all of a sudden, the eucalyptus tree produced oil and it flicked onto our building effectively dappling the the yellow uh the yellow facade i have pictures that i could supply the uh, the uh public works build uh ab about it and i tried to get a uh, an adjustment on the cost of that and failed miserably uh so we have no 
uh, desire to keep this tree. Uh, I would love to have a magnolia tree replace it, but the other trees in the block are New Zealand Christmas trees. And that's the sum of my comments. Thank you, um, Ms. Hall. And, and um, I believe you submitted a letter. I believe I saw a letter. Is that correct? I, su I submitted a letter in July of 79 and then along in November of the end of November of 70 of 19, 2019, excuse me. I went up to the, uh, the building, uh, the office in City Hall and I mentioned the fact that I had not, we had not received any word and Ms. Ms. Farquhar, is that her, her name? Uh, got on to it. She came out and looked at the tree and uh, Merle Easton uh, got in and asked her to come out again or someone else to come out again. And that's when they agreed that the tree needed to be removed. I have a copy of your letter, ma'am. So yes, it, it's the July 17th of uh, 2019. I guess the city, right. the, city, the city moves slowly. Yeah, it does indeed, but at least it moves. Well, that's a good thing. So thank you very much for your comments and, and, and being part of this. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know whether or not I needed to, to, to uh, uh, submit a formal uh, additional uh, application or not. So that's where that stands. I, 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 I think we're, I think we're, we're good. Uh, so, but thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gordon, I think you're up next. Mr. Andy Gordon. Yeah, we're just waiting for him to unmute. There he is. Thank you, thank you. Um, my name is Andy Gordon. I, I live on the street across the street from this tree. Um, I just wanted to ask a question real quick before I do make um, my objection. Um, it, it was mentioned that a large stature tree would replace this. Is there any indication as to what's, what size that tree would be at the time of replacement? Uh, Ms. Knobbery, can, can you speak? Are you able to speak to that this time or? Um, we typically plant 15 gallon trees and the reason is because they take a lot less water and they're easier to plant. Um, they're less expensive and the main reason for planting 15 gallon trees is because they take less water to establish. Um, they have a longer lifespan so we see a lot of times with larger stature box size replacements um, they take four to five times as much water as a 15 gallon tree. And ultimately when you stress a tree and it's very early, uh, very early on in its life, um, this results in their growth being stunted. So we see uh, that when you plant a 15 gallon tree, you end up getting a tree that grows a lot more successfully. And you'll actually in the first few years see a dramatic uh, growth with a 15 gallon tree. Um, but yeah, typically a 15 gallon. Great. Thank okay. you. Okay. So um, I just, you know, it, my objection at this point is, uh, you know, the pictures are a little, you know, that one picture where it, you know, you say there's no canopy, it, it doesn't show the whole picture. Um, like I said, I live on the street. Uh, when you look down the block, um, from the street, you can see that this tree clearly is the tree that connects to the trees across the street. It does create a beautiful canopy. And it was one of the things that really drew my wife and I to this block when we decided to purchase our home here. Um, and um, it, it looks to me like it could be trimmed to prevent anything from falling onto the house while still maintaining uh, the appearance that canopies over the street. That's all I really want to say. Okay, thank you very much for, for uh, participating. Is there anyone else, any other members of the public that wish to speak on this item? Uh, Mr. Clip, go ahead, you're, you're unmuted, sir. Oh, you're muted again. Now, now you're off. I'm, I'm, I'm here, I think. Um, 
Yeah, regarding the uh, the size of the tree. So for those who don't know, a 15 gallon tree is basically one and a half inch diameter. So that's how big the tree is going to be, maybe about six or seven feet tall and one and a half inch diameter trunk. So it's it's about the smallest version of the of a tree that one can put. It is actually this the smallest version of a tree one can put in in a public right of way and still be compliant with Article 16. Um, one thing I'd like to ask the department is regarding wood reuse. And so for a little bit of context in 2014, a whole bunch of city departments got together, spent a lot of uh, time and taxpayer dollars on putting together a brilliant urban forest plan that we since um, have not really used um, to any uh, impactful effect. But one of the recommend, key recommendations of that urban forest plan um, specifically recommends wood reuse. And it specifically recommends it because um, when we cut down a tree and chop it all up, as the city mostly does, we lose all of that sequestered carbon, all of the work that that city did um, for our environment. And so by reusing wood, we get to retain those benefits. And that is, again, why it is part of the urban forest plan. So I'm wondering, especially with a tree of this size, um, whether that is something that has been considered. And if not, why not? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clip. Um, Ms. Snobbery, do you want to respond? Or uh, I, I don't know that you're required to. I certainly include those in the comments of the director. I know I understand uh, the question. Um, we did not consider it for this specific tree. And I know we're looking into figuring out our wood reuse program. And I know that even like the Presidio has a mill and we were working with them before uh, COVID, but they basically shut their mill down. So we are struggling to find uh, wood reuse sources and a way to mill it and process it. So. It was not considered for this tree at this time, but I can ask what the status is of the wood reuse program and see if it would happen in time for this tree to be removed. And, and again, um, I myself do not know the timeline for this tree removal. Um, so I don't, I can't speak to the timelines of, of the wood reuse program or um, for the tree. Very good, thank you. And Mr. Clip, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Ms. Aubrey would be happy to Trade emails and, and let you, let you know what's going on with that, uh, Mr. Carnes. I think I see your hand up. I guess you're up next. Can you would you speak? Hi, can you hear me? Okay, sure can. Yeah. Hi. So by uh, Renee and uh, my friend Merle Easton. I didn't realize that was your home, but um, that, that's a pretty nice tree. Um, I guess it's just too big. The uh, the the thing I've, I've seen happen sometimes is that a tree is designated as uh, a removal candidate. We have a bunch of them in North Beach where I live and I walk by them daily and, and say, gee, that was approved for removal like two years ago, but what the heck? Anyway, so, you know, I, as you mentioned, the tree, the city moves slowly. Uh, that tree probably will, will remain there for God knows how long. Um, and the replacement tree, um, we had a few large ficus replaced in North Beach, uh, and they were a 48 inch box, which is quite large. And I think the trees are probably seven or eight feet tall. They're magnolias. And, um, but you know, they, they haven't, they, they're, they're not going to produce any shade for probably 10 plus years. So you have to be up, you know, up for that. So, so I guess my two comments boil down to one, the tree probably won't be removed. It's a very, very expensive removal. And uh, number two, the replacement tree will probably be very small for a long time. So good luck. Very good, thank you, sir. <coughs> Are there any other comments on this uh, item? Anyone else have to do it? Do we have any other hands up? I don't see any. Uh, no other hands up. So with that, uh, let's move on to the next item on the agenda. Item uh, number five on the agenda, order number 203-789. It's 4621 Mission Street to consider removal of two street trees with replacement 
at 4621 Mission Street. Staff approved the removals and the public has protested. Ms. Barberry, would you like to uh, make the presentation? Um, so I just want to point out that like, I was working too quickly and okay. I made a typo and um, the application is correct is for three trees. Um, okay. And we so, sent a hearing notice that said two trees. So that's why this is highlighted because I'm correcting it here. Got it. But, um, it's three trees, not two trees. Um, I believe anyone who's protested, protested on the basis of the three trees. Um, but because of this typo, we are requesting to just continue this item. And we will still go through these slides for informational purposes. Um, but we want to present it when we haven't made a typo on the hearing announcement. Um, okay. And so sorry for everyone that has to come back um, to hear that, but we, we can go through these slides and we, we can hear public comment, um, but I didn't want to present it as if I hadn't made a typo on the hearing announcement. Um, Very good, so we'll, we'll, we'll go through it and as if we are, we, we'll just say we're gonna continue. Move forward. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so the first tree, um, it's a myoporum with, thr with thrips. And uh, thrips is an insect that has basically been killing um, the myoporums in San Francisco. There's, there it is. It's a really kind of gross looking insect. It's kind of cool looking. Um, it lays its eggs in, in like the pores of the stomata of the, of the, tr of the leaves and um, it causes defoliation. And um, you know, when a tree loses its canopy, it also stops putting energy towards its root reserves. And so we've seen a lot of myoporums um, because they have a low vigor in the canopy. We also see them uh, root fail. Um, and I wanna point out that the, the owner of the building actually applied to remove these because um, as we all keep saying, uh, city moves slow. So um, in this case, the Bureau of Forestry's timeline, because we're um, doing tree removal and pruning on, on a grid cycle, the grid for this um, area wasn't going to be uh, coming for at least another year. Um, and so the applicant felt that um, if he had to wait that long, he would go ahead and take on the cost of the maintenance himself. Um, and that's why we're hearing this case today. And so this one, yeah, it's a myoporum and it has a disease called thrips. The canopy doesn't look as bad as one might think, but inside the canopy, you can see that there's a lot of dieback. Um, there's again, no interior canopy. Um, that has all died off. It has the least access to the sun and when the tree is diseased and the leaves aren't um, photosynthesizing, it's not going to retain them. And then the second tree, is a ficus here. Um, it has had a major failure, you know, equivalent to its size. Um, so basically from in the past, it's only half of its canopy is, is still remaining. Um, it is extremely stagnated in growth and its root crown is actually buried. Um, so it also has very poor structure. Um, it has just a tuft of canopy at the very top. If this tree had the potential to grow larger, it would potentially have limb failures. However, in this case, the tree has barely grown in the last several years um, and it has a buried root crown. Root crown excavation would be extremely difficult in an area where there's a um, high traffic sidewalk and it may or may not even be successful. So there you can see that the root crown is buried. Um, so a buried root crown means that not very much oxygen is actually getting to the roots. Um, most trees have their roots in the top 36 to 18 inches of the soil. Um, there's no such thing as deep roots, really. Um, they need oxygen and that usually exists at the top layers of the soil. Um, and it has had a major limb failure and it has not really recovered from that. So it lost a lot of its photosynthetic material and it's taken a lot of time to recover. Um, the wound wood is not even that compartmentalized and I think that's because it has low vigor um, so trees put on what's called as wound wood and what's called wound wood, it's um, 
part of a process called compartmentalization of decay in trees. And they put on this wood to stop decay um, from furthering. And in this case, the edges are not um, very sealed off. And you can see this like smooth, sealed off bark whenever you see a, a cavity. And in this case, it's not. Um, so it's still kind of decaying, albeit slowly. Um, and then the second tree is a similar ficus. This one has not had a limb failure, but it's also very uh, stagnated in its growth. Um, it's right next to a street light. So if the, there were a chance that it could grow larger, uh, we'd probably come back and remove any of that additional growth just to make clearance for the street light. So anytime it would be putting on leaves, um, and growing in canopy, it would just be hit back to make clearance for that street light. Um, but again, I don't think it has this potential to grow large because we have um, photos of these trees from at least a decade back and they have not grown much in size. Um, so they have pretty low vigor and slow growth. Um, so they're not really putting on the needed growth here. Um, so again, here's that poor structure we're talking about. Um, it's pretty difficult to correct at this size. Uh, ficus are not very resistant to decay. They're probably a medium level tree that when you consider resistance to decay. So if you were to prune back and remove limbs to fix the structure, um, it would likely introduce decay into this already small stagnated tree. So again, the root crowns, I believe that they have been buried um, I don't know when this tree is planted. I have to go look back in the records, but um, when it was planted, its root crown was buried and it's essentially stagnated at this point. And so these are photos of the trees from 2012. They're not very much bigger. Um, and so, and the bust zone is gone. Um, the applicant has asked to remove and replant the trees. Um, this is not construction related. The applicant has just asked to remove and replant them to um, beautify the street. And the applicant has asked to replace the three Mexican fan palms um, because they are culturally significant in the mission. Uh, so to be consistent with how we handle similar cases and the applicant's willingness to perform the removal and replacement on behalf of the Bureau of Urban Forestry, we approve the removal of this application. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Nabre. Um, so as the department has asked this be continued, um, my recommendation to the director is just going to be this can be continued. But if anyone would like to speak on this matter, to let the department know of their concerns or issues, or if they want to save their powder for the official hearing, so be it. So I see Mr. Karn's hand is raised. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, just my, my uh, can you hear me okay? Sure can. My standard comment. Um, so when I first saw this listed, it was back in it's quite a while back. Anyway, the there was no application. It said the, that the owners had applied for an application, had, had applied for a permit. But when I went, went online to the to the permit file, there's nothing there. But there was a long description on the web on the website that said the neighbors just thought these these trees were ugly and wanted to get rid of them to make things look better. And um, so that's pretty much it. But please, uh, Bureau of Urban Forestry, you know, it's very difficult for us out here in the peanut gallery, you know, we, to get information on what, what you're doing is incredibly difficult. And if you give the permit number, we can at least look that up. Other than that, we're, we're running blind out here. It's just, it's just, we probably don't have the resources to travel down there and look at it. And we're not arborist anyway. But any, any information you can provide um that we can get access to much appreciated so and if you could publish publish the uh, application on this one before the before it comes up for hearing again i'd appreciate it thank you very good thank you mr carnes and just just for the record i'm not gonna i'm not re i'm not gonna make notes on any of this because it's just gonna be continued so uh but but please feel free to share uh mr clip you had your hand up next so why don't you go ahead uh, yeah, just very briefly, I would just strenuously object to planting more palms along the side and along any type of public right of way. <laughs> they have absolutely almost the, the, the equivalent of a blade of grass when it comes to their carbon benefits. 
Um, so please, please, I, I'm not trying to say anything against the, the cultural significance of them. I cannot speak to that. Um, but in, in terms of what our city needs, it is not that. Thank you. All right, Mr. Clip. Uh, Mr. Nolte, your hand is up. Would you speak, please? Or... Uh, yes, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay, great. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I was also going to say the same thing as uh, Josh Clip was saying about the palm trees. I, I don't see that as, as, as a realist, realistic uh, thing for the Mission District. Um, uh, it may be culturally uh, for them, but um, a palm tree does not uh, uh, sequester the, the, you know, there's a number of things that palm tree doesn't do that uh, the, other, the current trees that are there does do. So it's not replacing the trees that were there and, and what, 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 the, what they were doing for the uh, shade and so forth for the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Great, thank you for speaking, Mr. Nolte. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Okay, uh, seeing none, um, we'll close this item. And again, uh, this item is just gonna be continued at the request of the department due to the, the typo. So um, uh, we'll get it right next time. Okay, so with that, let's go on to the next item, item, or item number six on the agenda. It's order number 203-790. 2943 Harrison Street, consider removal of one street tree with replacement and removal of one significant palm tree on private property without replacement at 2943 Harrison Street. Staff approve the removals and the public is protesting. Ms. Dawberry, would you like to speak? Hi, so um, yes, we're considering the removal of a significant palm tree and a street tree that is a Prunus sericifera plum tree. And sorry about that. Um, so essentially the plum tree is in poor condition. Um, and what we've seen with these plum trees over and over again is that they don't put on a ton of growth um, now with the warming climate and lack of rain. Um, and I'll talk about the plum tree first. Um, you can see in January, 2020, it is flowering. Um, and then there's been negligible annual growth. Uh, you can see the nodes, like basically from the tip of that tree, um, you can see like growth and it's put on very little. Um, and it has a little bit of decay on one side, probably from being hit by a car. Um, so it's also poor at compartmentalizing that. Um, the owners agreed to replant this tree. It is replaceable. And yes, yeah, so here's the, the decay happening. There's no wound wood on that. So there's not the, the nice ring of compartmentalization that you see on trees that, that have good vigor. When a tree has good vigor, it has the energy to dedicate to compartmentalizing and sealing off decay. Um, and also because one half of this tree is dead, it can't transport water up to its leaves and uh, vice versa, the leaves can't transport sugars down to the roots. Um, so for this reason, the tree has multiple reasons. The tree has low vigor um, and also it's not compartmentalizing the very decay that's causing its inability to transport nutrients. And um, the palm tree, sorry, these are a little out of order. I'll go back to the palm. Basically, um, this setback is very small and uh, this palm tree has essentially reached the size where it's like, starting to hit the property. Um, and so when the wind blows, it actually, palms can sway quite a bit when the winds blow. Um, any video of like a hurricane in Florida, you'll see the palms just bend down almost towards the ground and fling back up. So. They have, they're incredibly spring loaded um, and they have quite the potential to hit and damage property. And so you can see it's planted right up against the property facade, um, which is why it has very little space to grow. And um, you can see on the left, the courtyard is actually a lot smaller than one might think. Um, because of this, we're not requiring the replacement of that palm tree. 
but the owner has agreed to, and therefore we are requiring through the permit to uh, replant that plum tree. And so we will get a, a new street tree in return for that removal that we are granting. Um, but this palm tree, we don't believe that there's adequate space to replant. Um, the owner can do what they want with that site. If they wanna plant something, they can. Um, but you can see on the photo on the right, the distance between that fence and the existing tree, it's only about 10 feet. So we require that trees also be spaced adequately, um, 15 to 20 feet, usually 20 feet because we would like to see large stature trees go in. Um, so there probably wouldn't be very much room for two trees without the canopies competing with one another, um, but we will advocate for a larger stature replacement tree here because there are no high voltage lines. They're just service drops. So those are low voltage, trees can touch those. Um, so we'll be advocating for a nice, healthy, large canopy uh, tree that can um, survive this future climate, whatever that might bring. Um, but we're not requiring the replacement of that palm tree. Uh, so to be consistent with how we handle similar cases and the declining health of the plum tree and the fact that the palm tree is growing in a space that is considered too small for this palm tree, we approve the removal of both trees with replacement of one. Okay, very good, thank you. So, so with that, uh, are there any members of the public that wish to speak? If so, please raise your hand and We'll get to you. Okay, Mr. Carnes, you got your hands up quickly. Go ahead. Mr. Carnes. Yeah, okay. Can you hear okay. me now? Sure can. Okay, so again, this is a, you know, the third on the uh, list of six trees, but there's no permit information online. And I think I've run into this before, and that is that there are two ways to apply for a permit. One is you print out a piece of paper and write a check and mail it in. And those get, get filed in the permit file online. And then there's another way to, there's a, there's a new way to apply for a permit, which is to go online, type in your information and hit, hit send. And uh, you, you'd think those would go online <laughs> right away, but they don't. They, they get buried somewhere. And if I wanna see a copy of it, I have to go through records request, et cetera. So Buff, please, you know, put all of your permits in the online permit file so we can we can take a look at them. Without that, it's, it's we're just flying blind, as I mentioned. So, um, and the, the little prune tree doesn't look like it's bothering anybody. You probably leave it there for quite a, quite a few more years, but uh, there you go. Thank you. All right, very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your comment. All right, um, I see Joyce G. Yes, Joyce G. Hello? Yes, go, go ahead, ahead Joyce. OK, great. Um, I actually live at 2941 Harrison Street. The address for this property is 2941 Harrison to 2943 Harrison. I live on that upper unit for the for um, of that building, and I just kind of want to reiterate um, that when the wind is blowing, that palm tree has actually um, damaged my windows, which we replaced two years ago with double pane windows, and they're eighty four inches, so they're custom windows. So those windows are about two thousand dollars each. So there is already property damage that is being, um, that's actually happening now with that palm tree. So uh, we would like to remove it. It is really close to the house and it's really big. Um, regarding that plum tree, that plum tree is really sad. It's really sick and it has been hit by, um, by trucks. They've been doing work on the Garfield Square pool and park. There's um, Azteca Hauling has about four different trucks that they park on the street. We don't have permit parking. And of course, all of the people who come to play in the soccer field, sometimes they'll, they'll get a little bit too close to that tree. So it is, it is really damaged and it's, and it's really sad. 
you know, and um, it's not recovering. Um, we are very, very conscious of plants if you and, and planting a lot of trees in our backyard. We have olive trees, we have an avocado tree, we have two Japanese maples. We are big supporters of having trees, um, but we, we don't want them to be really ill or in poor health. And that's why we, we, we're making the move to um, replace that tree with something that will thrive and not just barely survive. So that's, that's my comment. Very good, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for calling in. Uh, Mr. Cliff, I see your hand is up. Thank you. Um, yeah, just the, I have a question about the um, stature of a replacement tree. Um, as Ms. Knobbery noted, there's no high, no high voltage uh, overhead, um, which usually is um, preventative or prohibitive to planting a larger stature tree. Um, and my guess is that's been the case for a while. Uh, and yet one of the smallest statured short-lived trees, which is the purple leaf plum that incidentally is such a bad street tree, it's not even on the approved street tree list anymore. Somehow that was planted uh, in this prime space. So I guess what I'm wondering is, uh, you know, if we've known this for a while, why wasn't the larger tree planted there a long time ago? And what assurances do the public have that a large stature tree is actually going to go in there now, um, really maximizing this uh, unique basin? And as somebody who looks at a lot of basins, I can say that there aren't many along public rights of way where you have the opportunity to plant large statured um, trees that have the most um, environmental benefits. So I, I guess seeing what's in there right now does not inspire confidence that um, you know something larger is gonna go in. And I, I guess that's my question is how- uh, Again, Ms. Snobbery, I mean, if you wanna respond, you're, you're welcome to, it's not necessary. Uh, uh, up to you. Uh, I, know, we, the, I know the department is, is required to, those are the approved street trees and required to follow whatever the code requires, but go, go ahead if you'd like to respond or if not. Um, because this is a permit application and because our, our code does allow for us to require a large stature tree, we will work with the applicant. Um, and you can write that in your decision that we'll work with the applicant to plant um, the, a tree and species and size suitable uh, for the space um, and the applicant will work with the Bureau of Urban Forestry to select the tree. All right, very good. Um, any other comments on this, uh, this matter? Okay, seeing none, we'll close uh, um, item number six on the agenda and we'll move to the last item on the agenda. Uh, item number seven, it's order number 203-796-198 McAllister Street. Uh, the order supersedes public works order 203-791 to consider removal of eight street trees with replacement at 198 McAllister Street. Staff approved two removals and the public has protested. Staff has denied the removal of six street trees and the applicant has appealed. Ms. Newberry. Newberry. So we applied, we um, approved the tr one tree on McAllister and one tree on Hyde. Okay. And the tree we approved on Hyde, um, it's site number four, but obviously you can see that there aren't four trees here. Um, it's the tenderloin, it's very hard, difficult to establish trees. Um, so the tree here that we've approved for removal has low vigor. It, it's essentially going to be replaced in kind. It has not grown much um, since it's been planted. Um, so we approved that tree. And then we approved uh, site number three, tree number three on Hyde. It's an olive and um, it's the one tree here that we approved um, that is Similar to the other trees, um, yet it lacks clearance um, over the road and there's not any really amount of structural pruning that can correct the clearance. Um, you're required to have 14 feet of clearance from the curb upward and um, there's large wood here where the where that 14 foot mark is. Um, so you can't prune that and so that would just just continue to be hit by trucks and other vehicles parking. 
Um, so we did approve that tree. Um, the rest of the trees we denied. Um, and this is a large stature established olive tree. Um, and we believe that the project can work around this tree. Um, the sidewalk damage here could be mitigated with a larger basin. And we denied uh, this other tree, uh, 57 high tree two, um, also another uh, tree that we don't see any clearance issues with. Um, it's at the curb. Um, and because the trees are at the curb, we think that the project can uh, work around these trees and make room and have access points elsewhere and retain trees that are established. Um, again, it's really, really difficult to establish trees in the tenderloin. Um, everybody knows it's a very, very harsh condition, not just for humans, but for trees. Um, and for this reason, that getting trees to even be this size in the tenderloin is extremely difficult. Um, so another tree we denied. Um, I will admit that this one could use a little bit of pruning to bring in um, some of the overextended limbs. Um, but again, we are loath to approve trees in the tenderloin um, that can even get to the size. Um, it's extremely difficult to establish trees and let them grow in the tenderloin and protect the basins from all the things that enter the basins and um, keep the tree from growing. Um, trees in the tenderloin need a lot more water than your typical replacement tree uh, because of the various salts and things entering the basin. And this provides some much needed canopy in an area that has very little canopy. And uh, another tree we denied uh, for the same reasons. Again, it doesn't lack clearance and it's at the curb. So we're hoping the project can work around these trees. And the other thing is because these trees are are small but yet established. Um, we think that there, you know, there should be adequate space for the building. Um, that you don't have large canopies that would need to be drastically pruned back to make room for scaffolding. Um, this tree is an empty basin, so um, thankfully the project, I believe, will be replanting it. Um, well, the project will be replanting it, um, so we are appreciative of that. Um, sorry, we put a slide here that didn't belong there, but. The one on the right, please ignore the one on the left. <laughs> the tree on the right has some canopy, but we denied that because we think that that um, canopy can be pruned to allow for sidewalk clearance. And um, this is the replacement plan. It, it currently shows 16 trees, um, but I'm not quite sure, and I'm hoping the applicant can speak to this, um, where the final placement of vaults are. And so I just wanna point out that it's a removal of eight trees where the project is um, going to, or planning to replace with 16 trees. Um, but I would like to ask um, about the final placement of vaults because we have seen that vaults can eliminate one to two tree sites per vault. So if there's two vaults, then we think that the replacement of um, 16 might actually be 14 to 12. Um, either way, it, it appears to be a net gain of trees, um, but we don't want to overpromise replacement trees uh, because that can lead to issues with issue, uh, the permit in the future. Um, but we do hope the applicant can speak to placement of vaults and maybe um, give an estimate of the replacement number. Okay. So to be consistent with how we handle these cases, um, the health of the olive trees, the situation in which they're being removed, um, we denied the removal of the six of the trees and approved the removal of two. Okay, very good. So since there's questions for the applicant, uh, before we go to the public, uh, I think it's probably appropriate to have the applicant speak. If someone from the applicant would like to speak, you push the raise the hand button. Well, there I see one. Uh, okay, Mr. Z uh, Zucker. Good evening. Good evening. Um, could I, I sent a presentation for a slideshow. I was told I might be able to get, share my screen or have it put up. I, yes, I think uh, that's go ahead. Um, this is Justin. I've got to uh, promote you and then um, I'll ask you to go ahead and share your screen. Uh, are you there? 
It looks like he disappeared. No, I had to make him a panelist. So oh, he I see. Okay. Screen. He went over the other screen. Gotcha. 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 He's there. Yeah. But he's still on. So, the, Justin. Oh, he's already doing it. Okay. Great. Okay. And, Cerise, do you want to have the time? Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Justin. Justin, go ahead. Good evening, Hearing Officer Goldberg. Justin Zucker from Ruben Junius and Rose. On behalf of applicant UC Hastings, and with me from Hastings is Rhiannon Baylord and Arborist Roy Leggett. Hastings appeals the denial of permit to remove six street trees and is also here in support of the permit to remove two street trees, a total of eight trees adjacent to the campus. Hastings has been a long-standing long neighborhood partner with the current building having been constructed in 1965 and seeks to equitably mitigate the impact of the construction related street tree removals. To that end, Hastings presents a green community benefits plan that Rhiannon will elaborate on later. As part of its applications, Hastings will plant double the number of trees removed as mentioned by staff planting three trees on Golden Gate, 10 on Hyde, and three on McAllister. Someone from the construction team will be able to speak as to the vaults, but it's my understanding that the vaults will go in place where they currently are and should not impact the design, but they will speak to that shortly. The old Hastings building is being demolished to make way for sorely needed student housing within a highly efficient, beautiful, sidewalk activating and academic and residential building, purposely designed to welcome students visitors, and the community. Removal of the eight trees is necessary for three reasons. First, removal is necessary to ensure a safe construction site. Second, retention of the existing street trees throughout construction is not feasible. And third, the conditions of the existing street trees support the removal, which Arborist Roy will address after. As seen in the red, the project calls for demolition of the existing building and excavation of a pit in some places to a depth of 25 feet below surface and immediately adjacent to the sidewalk. The excavation requires new shoring piebacks and the sidewalk itself will be fully removed and replaced. The contractor build group has carefully considered possible configurations for the construction site but due to constrained conditions in the surrounding urban area, the project will need to utilize a drive lane, the parking strip and sidewalk space along Hyde Street. For coordination of activities with trucks lining up such as concrete delivery and mobile placing boom setup for the foundation and perimeter basement wall pours. By removing the trees, the project will be able to maintain three lanes of travel on Hyde Street, which is being required by SFMTA. If the trees cannot be removed, the project's site logistics plan would cause the closure of High Street down to two lanes, which SFMTA has indicated they will not support. Even if two lanes were allowed by SFMTA, the existing trees along High Street lean into the street and they would have to be trimmed to the curb, necked, which would result in damaged trees susceptible to failure. Moreover, it is not feasible to retain the existing trees because due to construction needs, significant trimming of the trees roots would need to be done for excavation and shoring. The root trimming is likely to compromise the tree structure, tree's structural integrity and coupled with necking, likely to shock the trees resulting in their demise down the road. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for questions. I'll now turn it over to uh, Roy then Rihanna. Thank you. Okay, uh, next speaker. Can you identify yourself, please? Who's up next? Hi, hi, uh, this is Roy Leggett. Um, okay. Hi, I'm the uh, consulting arborist um, Mr. Zucker just made reference to. Correct. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, my associate Aaron Wong and myself, uh, both of us are certified arborists and <clears throat> tree risk assessors. And we, um, evaluated these trees together. Um, there are a lot of injuries to the trees from trucking uh, trucks and I don't know, buses, whatever it is, passing traffic. Uh, the trunks of these trees are generally all out of plumb. So they're leaning this way or that and branch structure is relatively low with a lot of uh, beat up branches. Um, there is canopy, I give you that. Um, Susan 
is right that it's a rough neighborhood and the trees that are somehow established and have grown in that neighborhood are uh, difficult or ch it's a challenge to replace them. So uh, we, we are of the opinion that we're dealing with fair to poor condition trees in each case because of all of the injuries going into a construction uh, project and looking at tree retention when you're starting with trees that are already compromised like that is not likely to lead to a, a very successful outcome. Uh, even if um, the, the physical space uh, somehow can be worked out where they can actually mobilize all the trucks and cranes and equipment uh, and, and materials that they need to build this and work around uh, these trees. Uh, I expect that the trees will both be heavily cut back and they will also sustain a lot of damage uh, from the construction process. Uh, the, the whole idea of going into that with trees that are in at best uh, fair condition and more typically poor condition is it, those aren't great candidates to uh, really put into that equation. I don't think we're gonna have a great outcome that way. The fact that Hastings uh, is putting in uh, all of these new trees, they're gonna be putting those in with a continuous trench um, irrigated and um, a, far, a far more conducive environment for root development than the current trees have. So it's gonna be an improved infrastructure that is tree oriented and benefiting the trees. So although there are a lot of social um, concerns about losing trees, I think that the new trees will have opportunity to perform well. And I think that's an important uh, weighty factor in this particular case. So that, that's okay. all I have for you. Well, I, I have some questions. So, um, accepting the fact, I mean, uh, Ms. Nobri also spoke to it, that it's a very challenging site um, for trees. So, and these ones, for, for lack of a better reason, are, are survivors. What, what kind of trees would be planted and what would make you believe that the new trees uh, would be uh, more successful? Or how would they? How how can we essentially guarantee that they would survive and thrive as opposed to these ones that are hanging on? Well, uh, John, I think those are great questions. Um, as far as the uh, the new trees that are going in, I don't know the species, but I know they're going to be thirty six inch box trees, so they're going to have stature which is above and overhead. Uh, the the canopy won't be large and developed yet, but they'll have that lower framework of trunk and branch structure that gets the canopy already overhead where we don't have, um, you know, vandalism, uh, for instance, just branches getting broken off by passersby. Uh, the trunk is gonna be larger with thicker bark and more substantial bark in any species, regardless of the species of the tree. And then what I was hinting to earlier is that there's a continuous trench in the design where it's gonna be, it, we're basically gonna have a horticultural soil environment running along the whole curb length. So it'll be like a, a big planter bed that's underneath the surface pavement that allows for root growth to develop through that entire area. And it's not, um, it's not just a construction site when we're done, but it's actually horticultural soil. So okay. that's why new trees would be able to grow in that and be uh, successful. That's the idea. Okay. Okay, so, so, so we don't know what trees they're gonna be, but, but they're ones that were, and because of the new condition, you're fairly confident would, would do well. well. Well, I don't actually know the species. I, I've was asked to evaluate the existing trees and then you know make comments on that in the planning site. Uh, there may, 
you know, maybe it may be that Mr. Zucker has more information about the uh, new species that are going in, or um, I'm sure we can work that out with uh, Bureau of Urban Forestry. I, I would certainly be willing to um, put effort in on new tree selection. And so that it's the best that we can do and provide canopy that is um, likely to succeed there. Okay. All right. No, I mean, it is, it is a very challenging location. I'm well aware of that. So um, I appreciate that. I, um, and to, is there someone else to speak from uh, the applicant? Yeah. Hi there. This is Rhiannon Baylord. I'm the executive director of operations. However, I was going to ask if it's all right with you all to have Eric Quinn, who is with Build Group, respond to the question on the vault uh, that Ms. Knobbery raised, which we think is an important one. And he has some information on that. Please. I think that would be very useful. Uh, I've given him, uh, he can go ahead and speak. You, you can go. Please unmute. Can anyone hear me? Sure can. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, do you mind going back to the slide that shows the, the plan view of our project with all the new tree locations called out? Just so I can speak to that. That one right there, perfect. So um, there are there is one tree location <clears throat> that is on this plan that is going to be in conflict with an existing uh, pg e vault. This um, big concrete vault was originally built um, to service the building as a network vault back in the 50s or 60s. Um, the project plan was to have this vault removed. Unfortunately, pg e has very recently denied um, that because they're currently using it as a distribution vault for other properties in the area. Um, it no longer services uh, the, the existing building, but um, other buildings uh, in the area. So if you count from uh, the corner of McAllister and Hyde on Hyde Street, four trees back is right where that vault sits. So there you are right there. That, um, that concrete manhole or vault is the width of the sidewalk um, and about uh, 18 feet wide. So there's no way to plant that specific tree there um, because of sort of this um, decision made by pg &E to keep the vault um, beyond or, or after construction. Um, so I know that Rhiannon will speak on mitigation measures after this, but I'm just speaking on the vaults that are conflicting. And then if we go, there's an, there's the, uh, there's a number seven vault um, currently on Hyde Street as well, just to the south of that um, distribution manhole. Um, We're moving that so that it's out of the way of this uh, soil trench um, and moving that down to the corner on Hyde Street. Um, I, we should be able to get it out of the way of that uh, far south tree on Hyde Street. So that's allowed to be uh, planted, but the exact location that tree might have to be shifted uh, so slightly to um, avoid that uh, that vault and the clearances that pg e recommend. But this is not a new vault. It's just a shift in, of an existing vault um, to try to make way for all these trees on Hyde Street. Okay, so, so the representation is that, that only one of these trees that's proposed would be eliminated because of the vault. Correct, um, with a possible second, but I, I can't say guaranteed or, or, or not, whether that okay. second one, um, the, the far south on High Street, so if you're on High Street, the far right one that we're looking at right now. Okay, so Ms. Naubry, do you have any questions since the builder's here to speak to the vaults that, you, that you're? Um, no, I just, just to be clear, um, when like the decision is written, we, we won't say, that it's the replacement of 16, um, but we'll say with the estimate of replacement of 14 and um, that in lieu fees will be paid for any trees that can't be replaced. Um, so depending on the building frontage, the, 
Um, oh, I'm sorry, actually, I can't speak to the in-lieu fees on a, a state-owned property, um, but we will say that the maximum of 14 trees is likely to be planted. Um, but I think the point is that it's, a, it's still a net gain of trees, it sounds like. Um, but we just want to be very transparent about the number of replacement trees is really just the point of getting the vaults kind of out of the way. Okay, so uh, for my question, is this, are these city street trees or are these, are the, is that state property? These are city street trees, but the building is on state property. So the trees... <laughs> So if they're removed from the city property, there would still be in lieu fees or no? Sorry. So if if they were to remove trees without um, an equal number of replacements, we would assess in lieu fees for the loss of each tree site. Um, but in this case, there isn't a net loss of trees. And okay. State, state properties don't trigger the construction code. Gotcha. Okay. Super, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that information. And, and no problem. Uh, so um, our next speaker from the um, applicant. Yes, hi everybody. This is Rhiannon Baylord. And just to spell that name, cause it's difficult. It's R-H-I-A-N-N-O-N -N 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 is the first name and last name is Baylord, B-A-I-L-A-R-D. I'm the executive director of operations at UC Hastings Law. And today I'm gonna be speaking about our green community benefits plan, uh, which is our plan to mitigate uh, for the trees that have to be removed as a, as a result of this campus housing project. Uh, but what I wanna do first is just to answer one of the questions that you raised, uh, hearing officer Goldberg, which is uh, about why these trees would be successful. I know the arborist Roy Leggett uh, answered that in terms of of some of the technical and the horticultural aspects of the um, ways in which they'll be planted. The other piece I want to mention is for the trees that we're going to be planting both on site and we're also proposing some off site replacement and I'll mention that in just a moment. We're going to be doing maintenance as well as a commitment to replace those trees and both of those for a 36 month time frame. So in other words, uh, we're going to be working with a community partner to do uh, insured watering, pruning, you know, anything that's needed along those lines, uh, as well as, uh, as was pointed out, you know, we, we are subject to vandalism in the Tenderloin. So if those trees get removed, uh, we'll be willing to replace those for a 36 month time frame, um, which is essentially the period of, of construction for us. Um, so just in with respect to, oh, and then the other question you asked, I apologize. Uh, you were asking about the species of the trees. All of the species, of course, are going to come from urban forestry's preferred street trees list. Uh, we have already selected species for the on-site trees, which are golden rain on Hyde, water gum on Golden Gate, and uh, I think South Magnolia on, uh, Southern Magnolia, excuse me, on McAllister. However, all of that is subject to discussion and, and coordination with both community partners as well as the Bureau of Urban Forestry. Um, so with respect to our plan, as, as mentioned, uh, we've already talked about, of course, the on-site replacement. Sounds like we were, we were planning on a 16, sounds like we may be looking at 14. Uh, however, I do want to note that, of course, as stated, we are going to be doing maintenance for those as well as replacement if any of those are lost. Uh, and one thing I did want to mention as well is that there is a significant stand of mature trees on the other side of Hyde, um, so that even though these trees will be removed in, in the short term, uh, we do have a, a nice canopy, a nice shade structure on the other side of, of Hyde Street. So I did want to point that out. Um, but in addition to that on-site replacement, we are doing off-site placement of eight to 16 additional trees. Uh, and frankly, the reason that number is, is a spectrum is for just this type of thing. We want to make sure that we're doing more than just, you know, the two to one replacements. So we want to give some additional buffer there. So it's 18 to 16 trees within the broader Tenderloin neighborhood. Uh, that's going to be utilizing a mix of trees 
and, and here we've got, thank you, Justin, uh, that's going to be utilizing a mix of trees from the urban forestry preferred street trees catalog. Uh, of course, you can see here some proposed sites. Uh, we're looking at locations, of course, that have south and southwest exposures, avoiding SFMTA daylighting zones. These are some locations that we've already started to identify, but ultimately what we want to do is we want to, as part of this green community benefits plan, is have a collaborative process both with urban forestry as well as with our community partners. Uh, and so the idea is we wanna identify the right trees, the right locations, uh, so that it will have the greatest community impact uh, as well as being, being the best site. Oh, sorry about that. Seems like I'm getting a little bit of an Thank echo. You, Ms. Ms. So, yes, Ms. Baylor, your okay. time is up. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, you know, if, if we'll let you go a little longer if you have some more things you wanna I apologize. I was trying. I, I was answering no. questions at the beginning. I didn't realize my time was running at that point. That's okay. Go, you go ahead. We'll let you finish. I mean okay. Okay, I should have taken that into account, the answering questions. So uh, the other two pieces of our urban, of our community benefits plan, one is that we are going to be providing funding for a parklet uh, at La Casina Municipal Marketplace immediately across the street at Golden Gate and Hyde. Uh, we know that this doesn't directly offset the loss of ecosystem services from the trees, but it's a near-term community benefit providing open space, outdoor activation at a very very troubled corner for residents of the Tenderloin, who many of whom don't have uh, these types of opportunities. And then the, the final piece that we're doing is we are creating a green community benefits fund. We'll be providing the seed money for that. Uh, essentially what that is, is we're gonna be working with community partners uh, to form micro grants for greening projects within the Tenderloin. And, and first up uh, is to replace a tree that was lost at Bodecker Park. Uh, the hope there is that subject to COVID-19, we would be able to have a community engagement process around that. Uh, but nevertheless, that would be the first to kick off of that green community benefit fund that we would be working to create with other community partners. So in conclusion, I apologize for going long, but uh, our commitment is to work with um, the community to more than offset, you know, we're, we're talking about a three to four um, mitigation ratio for replacement of trees, three to four to one replacement of trees, as well as seeking to fund that parklet, uh, as well as this green community benefits fund fund in order to uh, mitigate for these near-term impacts, but also to be a good community partner for the Tenderloin. Thank right. you. Thank you, Ms. Pilot. Uh, I have a couple questions. Please. Um, so I guess the initial proposal was the 16 trees and now we're down to 14, maybe 15. And then uh, the additional eight to 16 trees, that's a pretty wide margin. Um, so I guess, um, you know, can we, you know, why such a, essentially a hundred percent difference in, in the number of trees that, that is being proposed? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the reasons for that spectrum was for just that this sort of possibility that that we learned about just now as we're having this discussion with, with the vaults. Um, but if it would be more beneficial to have a, a precise number of trees, we could go, you know, somewhere in, in the middle of that, so to speak, and, and see if a, a firmer commitment would be helpful. Well, I mean, I think, I think for the city and for the public, and the and the director in, in in making the director's recommendation, he'll make the final decision. Um, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that there's any you know nefarious thing, but obviously cost is always a factor. And, and if one had a choice between spending less or spending more, you'd go you'd go eight. Right. And so I I think the director would like to see a firm commitment that that um, that is willing to be held to. I think that would be influential to him. Yeah, I understand that. Um, let's, I mean, I think we could commit to uh, ensuring that we do a three to one ratio. Okay, so 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 we have the, so just so I, when I write it up. Um, so there's eight, tr yeah, go ahead. So, so, so we have 14 on site, 14 to 15 on site, and then how many additional Trees will Hastings commit if that's the 
collectors. So, assen so essentially assuming that we hold, it'll be 24 total, but assuming we hold strong with the, the 14, it'll be 10 off, 10 off site. Uh, if we end up with a situation where, you know, we, we end up having to go down to 13, then that means we would do 11 off site. So, so the, the two numbers sort of work in concert with each other. So you'll, the, the Hastings will commit to three to one, and these are 36 inch box, please? Yes. And uh, three I, let me, I apologize. I apologize. I know that's the case for the on site. Um, okay. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I assume it would be the same commitment for off site as well. I don't know if the arborist, if Roy has any, any thoughts on that, but my assumption is we would go with the same. Okay. And again, of course, that would be subject to size of off, off site tree wells. Okay. And, um, would be, you know, the only constraint I, I got and the commitments Three, three years of maintenance or replacement? Correct. And that's from, so we, we will be, that's from the point at which we implement and, and replace um, the on-site trees. Well, okay, well, so uh, again, let me clarify this so I could, when I write it up. Please. Is, so construction, is, you say it's three years. Mm -hmm. so, it should be done so, in Go ahead. So, so if the if the if the trees are in three years, it, 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 from that point, let's say you don't plant the trees in the in the neighborhood until a year later. That would, would that make that a, a two year commitment for them, or is it is it three years from the time those trees are being planted? Yeah. Well, we can do we can start to work on the off site in the near term. So the on site, of course, we're not going to be able to do until we've got the the construction completed. Um, right. But so it'll be three years from the point of which uh, the the trees themselves go in. Okay. Okay. Very good. That just so I can write that up. I appreciate that, and I appreciate uh, the interest. And, and uh, uh, let me ask uh, uh, Ms. Nalbury if she has any questions for you since we're here while you're um, here. Officer Goldberg, Mr. Leggett has his hand up as well. Okay, very right. good. Well, 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 we'll start with, with uh, Ms. Nobre and then we'll go with Mr. Leggett. Um, you can have, you can actually have Roy Leggett go first. Okay, Mr. Leggett, do you want to speak? Uh, yeah, sure, that's fine. Hi, um, well, Brianna made mention of uh, maybe having me weigh in on the off-site tree plantings that are community-oriented tree plantings. And um, I, I think that a good way to approach that would be to um, allow for flexibility in the size of trees going in, depending on the circumstances. Uh, for instance, um, I, I worked on a project with the Trust for Public Land where we collected um, tree data on a number of pocket parks, including and smaller neighborhood parks. And one of them was Bodecker. So I'm very familiar with Bodecker. And um, there are a lot of um, a lot of residents that really use that park. And it's it's a very valuable commodity. Um, and putting the tree in there, I think would would be it'd be appropriate to have a 36 inch box tree going in there. Um, and it might be appropriate in front of certain storefronts if those are locations because they need better clearances. But there might be other situations where, where smaller trees, um, Ms. Notberry made reference to smaller trees as uh, being prefer preferable in a lot of ways because the watering requirements are less and they establish quicker. Uh, they're, they're actually a better performing tree if, if you have the right circumstances to plant those. And uh, for the same reasons that public works likes to plant those smaller ones, I think that it might be good to build in a little flexibility uh, for this project, uh, just to allow for um, looking at smaller tree basins, maybe more, more limited, limited space or closer spacing and uh, other competing uses for the sidewalks. Um, so I don't know, smaller trees might have some benefits and advantages in the long term. So, so your recommendation or suggestion might be what a 15 inch box to a 36 inch box, depending on the size specific? Yeah, yeah the, smallest, the smallest tree, which is the tree that Public Works likes to install is it's called a 15 gallon tree. 
Okay. And the, and then the next size up is a 24, 24 inch box and then okay. 36 inch box. Okay, yeah. so it, it would be depending on site specific. Okay, just so yeah. we have a sense. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Uh, Ms. Aubrey? Um, I'd say if possible for the sake of the decision, I would require the, the 36 inch box for the on-site trees. Um, since those are going to be the replacement trees, we count for this permit specifically. Um, and then the offsite trees um, are kind of gravy on top of that. Um, but we ask that if you're not going to plant a tree that's the size that, that could be resistant to vandalism, is um, to consider putting some sort of screening, which I think the UC Hastings is pretty familiar with because I, I think I've seen that around that neighborhood. Um, so some sort of consideration for, for prevention of vandalism, but I think that the specific requirement for the box size um, only needs to apply to the trees on site. Very good, okay. All right, um, so with that, uh, we've got the applicant, we've got the department, let's go to the public and see um, if anyone from the public wishes to speak. I see a hand up, I don't know who's yet. Oh, um, so I have uh, Simon. Yes, hi, can you hear me? I can, yes, sir. Simon, it says hi. PLCB, can you, who's that? Yes, it's Simon Bertrand. I'm the executive director of the Tenderloin Community Benefit District. We're a property assessment district based in the Tenderloin. Um, and I wanted to, oh, can you hear me? I sure can. Great, and I wanted to speak uh, in, favor of the proposed project and the proposed green community benefits plan. Um, uh, so we represent a broad range of, of residents, property owners and business owners in 40 blocks of the Tenderloin. And I wanted to um, commend UC Hastings for the approach that it's taking um, you know, in this proposal. Uh, the, the, and we of course support the, the project, the building itself, but in this proposal, to remove these uh, olive trees in particular, um, uh, we do, uh, as has been noted by the department and by, uh, by the applicant, um, it's a tough environment and it's, uh, it's, a sh it's always a shame to remove a tree that is even just surviving, um, given that it can often be difficult to survive. But we wanted to commend the approach that UC Hastings has taken uh, in partnership with the community to develop a comprehensive plan that not only replaces the existing trees and, and, and does um, doubles the replacement on site, but also looks off site to how the community as a whole can benefit, uh, whether it be these, uh, I, I guess it was decided uh, uh, eight, eight to 12 trees, however, however many trees off site was, was the final determination that there would be off site trees. Um, and I, I think in addition to the replacement, the thing that's significant to me is the commitment to maintenance, because again, uh, given uh, how difficult it can be for trees to establish themselves in the tenderloin, that commitment to three years of, of watering and maintenance and potential replacement is, is uh, feels really significant in terms of the ability to, to guarantee that we will get, uh, that the tenderloin community will get um, a benefit in terms of increased uh, canopy. Uh, and then secondly, the, the uh, investment in the, um, Parklet across the street at the La Cocina Municipal Marketplace, as well as this idea of the um, Green Benefit Fund, seeding a Green Benefit Fund. Both of those feel like um, the, the, something which will uh, be able to support um, not necessarily trees in the tenderloin, but uh, greening in the tenderloin. And so the combination uh, of this entire proposal, plus the way that UC Hastings has approached it, um, you know, recognizing that there is a harm that is being caused here. Uh, it may be necessary, uh, but it is still a harm, but, but proposing a very significant um, uh, mitigation of that harm. Uh, so the Tenderloin Community Benefit District strongly supports the, the proposal. And um, I guess I will end it there. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much for speaking, sir. Uh, Mr. Clip, I see your hand up. Go ahead, yeah, sir. Can you hear me? Sure yeah. can. Uh, all right, thanks. So um, in the... Uh, the first uh, photo that that uh, Susan showed, um, I planted that tree six years ago with friends of the urban forest. I have a photo of me standing in front of it with a friend who I convinced to come out with me 
early on a Saturday morning and plant trees. And it's hard to emphasize how disheartening it is to see that work performed by volunteers like me who gave time and energy to put it in the ground, to see that undone just six years later. I don't know if it's even been six years, let alone to see the condition of it. Um, and speaking of trees and their condition, all of the conditions um, noted by uh, Mr. Leggett, I will just point out, we're under the supervision of the applicant since Prop E wasn't passed until 2017 and those trees uh, far preceded that um, in terms of who was responsible for their maintenance. Regarding trees being plum, um, trees not being plum is pretty much the state of most of the trees in this city. So that in and of itself should not be a reason that a tree is removed. And also trees being vandalized is also pretty much the state of trees in this city. Um, our standard for tree removal should never be what we think is a perfect tree because that doesn't exist in nature and it sure as heck doesn't exist in San Francisco. Also regarding an opportunity to perform well, they're gonna be planted in the exact same place. There's, there's really not at this point any reason to believe that just putting a, a new tree in is gonna mean it's gonna succeed. A better soil is not gonna fix the problem of vandalism and maltreatment that happens above grade. Uh, I'd also like to know this is the second time that I'm at a removal hearing related to trees and UC Hastings construction in just a few years. I understand that this is a multi-phase construction. I would be curious to know from the applicant uh, if we're going to be back here for any more proposed tree removals related to this multi-phase uh, construction. I'd also like to know if there's been any consideration for transplanting any of the existing trees so we don't lose the benefit of those altogether. This is something that Hastings has done in the past for removal in 2018. And if trees cannot be transplanted, has there been any consideration for wood reuse, perhaps even in uh, their designs? Finally, it may sound like I'm coming down pretty hard on Hastings, but I do wanna commend them for this plan. I do think it's a model of how businesses and development can work in partnership with communities and community organizations. With that, I will say also though, that a lot of this plan is dependent on cooperation from city departments. And unless those departments agree to this, it's not enforceable. For example, a tree at Bodecker Park, that's under the jurisdiction of Rec Park. If they don't agree to it, it's not going to happen. Commitments to plant additional trees in the surrounding neighborhood, that requires a permit from Public Works. Public Works doesn't give them the permit, it's not going to happen. So without the partnership of the city, this plan is only a plan, no matter how much the applicant intends to see it happen. So I would like to know if the city has, has or is willing to agree to it, and uh, if not, why not? And that's it. Uh Thank you. Very good. Thank you, sir. Um, Ms. Bylard, I mean, you're not required to respond. If, if you'd like to, you may, but uh, uh, it, it's not uh, not necessary. And uh, I don't see anything. All right, with this, we'll go to Mr. Nolte. I see your hand up while we go ahead, Mr. Oh, yes. Nolte. My name is uh, John Alti. I'm the co-chair of the Terraline Tree Campaign, and I've been dealing with trees in the Terraline for over 20 years. It surpasses the consultants and the other people that were talked talked uh, for the uh, for the property owner on this uh, 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 issue. So I, I really, you know, let's start back in. Uh, April of 2015, UC Hastings planted a shoescape project that had yearly, was a yearly a, a try, a, to replace the trees uh, on its uh, three um, sites at 100 McAllister, 198 McAllister, which is this site, and 200 McAllister. And I was there the other day. There were no uh, postings for this hearing on those trees on high. Why? That's the first issue. Second issue, when this was put on, the, on your website for, for, for removal, it only talked about two. Now we're up to another uh, uh, eight or whatever uh, trees to be removed. So you, you, when, you, when you posted it, it didn't even talk about you know, this amount of number of trees being removed. Next, Going back to 2015, it was a streetscaping uh, a project, the, over $2 million. And still part of that streetscaping is on the 200 block of McAllister. And you, you'll see right now that they want to put trees back on McAllister. Well, those are now gone. They are empty plots. They are supposed to be beds with other 
a tree, uh, with plants and so forth. I didn't hear anything about that in any of the presentation. And here the city, they spent $2 million on that plan. Now they wanted, you know, again, for free. And they knew about this plan for uh, developing the properties way back then. So I am concerned about Hastings and their partnerships, concerned about that, that uh, uh, saying that they're going to put 18 uh, inch boxes. Uh, 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 it should be 18 inch or 24 inch, 24 inch boxes to be put in. We want the fencing around the uh, tree plots because when they when they're planted, so they won't be lopped off. That's what happens. I put I personally um, police reports on tree uh, trees being destroyed right the next day after they've been planted. So I don't see it. I actually only a block away. So uh, then the last issue of a parklet, a one-on-one hide, that is supposed, that is city property now, and that's, they're supposed to be building on that property. It's the old post office. And that property is supposed to be now turned into a business until the money, the city gets money for one-on-one hide. So thank you. Why thank you, Mr. Nolte, oh, that's I'm your time. That. You shouldn't be putting a, a parklet up get a city property. Uh, all right, Mr. Nolte, thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Byler, you had your hand up. Do you want to just finish off or did you want to respond? Sorry about that. I was just trying to respond to the earlier um, speaker. Sure. Um, and uh, on that, I was just going to say that, you know, we absolutely agree. Um, and, and we look forward to, to working with the city, but we also look forward to, to working with other community partners. Uh, but the, the intent behind the mitigation plan is that it is supposed to be malleable. I mean, that was part of the reason that we had the spectrum. We agree with going off of the spectrum and having a firm commitment with three to one. Um, but we want to be malleable in terms of what's available. If Bodecker Park, if that tree replacement is not an option, we will do something else for the green community community benefits fund. Um, and so there, I don't think that there's any one location or site uh, that is going to make or break us for, for that mitigation plan. Absolutely agree that we do, we do hope and, and look forward to that, to that city partnership and, and working together. Um, but we're also going to be flexible in, in terms of what we implement to make sure we're, we're able to achieve the intent of the plan regardless. Very good. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Uh, let's see, where's my agenda? So I think that that was the final item on the agenda. So I will write this up and um, and send this to the director uh, for his decision. So I want to thank everyone for their time and their patience. Uh, um, these Zoom meetings are not always perfect. I also want to apologize to Clint Otwell and Cerise Waiters. I could have introduced them at the beginning of the hearing. They were behind the scenes making sure things were taken care of. So thank you, Clint. Thank you, Cerise. And then uh, uh, Ms. Nawberry, I, I probably butchered your name three or four times. I, I wasn't, I should have asked you before the hearing how I should pronounce it, but I failed to do so. So I apologize for that. And I promise no, next, no, time, no. next time I will make sure I get it right. So with that, I wanna thank you all for your time and uh, I will write these up and, and uh, get it to the director's office in short order. So thank you all. I think that's it. With that, we'll, Call the meeting to a close, and that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you.